Hello class, welcome to the final segment in lecture 16. And in this final segment, we are going to discuss the idea of a jet streak and use the idea of agiostrophic wind to diagnose what exactly happens in a jet streak. So first off, let's go ahead and define what exactly a jet streak is. A jet streak is usually defined as a corridor or area of locally strong flow within, say, something, a jet stream. So that could be the subtropical jet or that could be the polar jet. But the whole idea behind a jet streak is that you've got an area of locally enhanced flow or a corridor of locally enhanced flow that's present within a jet stream of some sort. And I also include the equations from the agiostrophic, uh, the agiostrophic segment that we talked about earlier so that we can reference this when we go to diagnose this uh, jet streak that we have shown up on the, on the screen here. So uh, outside of the core of this jet streak, the wind is roughly constant. It's not really accelerating. But here in the center of this jet streak, in the core of this jet streak, you can see we have some acceleration in the wind, which means these two equations are going to be useful to us since we have some acceleration. That means we've got an agiostrophic component in the flow, and we're going to use these concepts and these equations to diagnose what's going on here. So if you're looking at, uh, say, a contour, uh, a, height, uh, a, map of, uh, a map that has heights contour, Let's try that again. Let's say you're looking at a map that has contours of heights on it, say around 200 millibars, 250 or 300 millibars. A jet streak will usually show up in those contours as sort of a concave structure here. So you'll have the contours getting closer together where the wind is intensifying and then the contours will get farther apart as the wind is weakening. So this is a shape that you'll often see when you're looking at a jet streak. You'll see the height contours get close together as the wind gets stronger and then they get farther apart as the winds weaken. But let's focus on what exactly is going on. Uh, let's, let's focus on some of the more substantial physical consequences that might be going on here. So if we have wind that's accelerating, so the wind starts off relatively weak, then becomes really strong, that means we've got some sort of acceleration involved. And the acceleration vector in this case is color blue. So just like with acceleration, you take the velocity afterwards minus the, velo the velocity before, divide by time to get the acceleration. And if you do this vector subtraction here, you get a vector that points something like this. But we also have an equation for agiostrophic wind that we can use the right-hand rule on. Well, first, let's also take a look at this. So here we have when that's decelerating, so it's going from strong to weak, which means the acceleration vector points in the opposite direction. So again, acceleration colored blue in this case. Now, again, now let's actually go ahead and start applying this equation. So here we have the equation for agiostrophic wind, and we can use the right-hand rule to diagnose what direction that agiostrophic wind points. And also here, uh, away from these blue vectors, I'm assuming the acceleration is roughly zero. So the agiostrophic wind is also roughly zero. But let's focus on this point right here. So the acceleration vector points from, we'll say that's from west to east. And if we go to apply our right-hand rule, we'll get an agiostrophic wind that points from south to north, which is going to be given by this green arrow. And then over here, where my acceleration vector reverses direction, again, I can use the right-hand rule to get an agiostrophic wind vector that points from north to south. And then again, since I have negligible acceleration here, I basically have a negligible agiostrophic component. There, t strictly speaking, there is going to be some small agiostrophic component there, but it's going to be uh, relatively small compared to the agiostrophic winds given uh, the green arrows here. These, this agiostrophic wind is going to be much, much smaller than the agiostrophic wind that's going on here. But you may also remember the one of the consequences we discussed with this equation, if there's any divergence or convergence in the flow pattern, that must be due to the agiostrophic component of the wind. So wherever we've got convergence of agiostrophic wind, that means we've also got convergence in the actual wind field. And wherever we've got divergence in the agiostrophic wind, then we've got divergence in the wind field itself. So if we take a look over here, we've got a, an agiostrophic wind that is decelerating as we go from south to north. Since it's decelerating, that means we've got convergence of the agiostrophic wind, which also tells us that we've got convergence of the actual wind. The wind is converging at this particular point along the jet streak. And since we're looking at an area that's above ground, very far above ground, in fact, we're up near the tropopause, we've got, that means we've got convergence aloft, which means we're going to have sinking motion. And over here, we've got an agiostrophic wind that is accelerating, which means we've got divergence in this region, 
which is going to, since that's divergence a lot, that's going to give us rising motion. And again, since we have divergence of the adiostrophic wind, that means the wind itself must also be diverging. We must have a divergent flow pattern there. Then same idea here. You see, as we go from north to south, we have an adiostrophic wind that accelerates, meaning the adiostrophic wind is diverging, which means the flow pattern itself is also diverging, which was substantiated by this mathematical equation that we derived in the previous segment. And then similar idea here, I've got an adiostrophic wind that's decelerating. So I've got a convergent adiostrophic wind, which means I've got a convergent flow pattern. And here I've got convergence aloft as well, so that would give me sinking motion. And then again here I have divergence aloft, which is going to give me rising motion. So just using the concept of adiostrophic wind, we can explain how we can get rising motion or divergence aloft, which is colored in the red circles here and how we can get convergence aloft or sticking motion, which is colored in the blue circles right here. And to sort of illustrate, another thing that I want to introduce while we're discussing jet streaks is the anatomy of a jet streak. That is how, oft how meteorologists often refer to particular regions in jet streaks. So in the region that has, uh, where the wind hasn't accelerated yet. So this is before the wind has actually accelerated uh, to go through the, this is before the wind has actually gone through the jet streak itself. It hasn't gone through the locally enhanced flow yet. We refer to that as the entrance region of the jet streak. And then the region where the flow has gone through or has traversed the core of stronger winds, we refer to that as the exit region. And if my wind is blowing from west to east, so if you actually want to, you can get up and face uh, east or face a direction that you can call east. If you're on the to, the to the left of the direction you're facing, so if you're facing east, to the left of you will be the north side of the direction you're facing. We typically refer to that as the left region. So typically, in the, also in the northern hemisphere at least, a lot of times you'll have, or typically you'll have colder air that's to the left of the jet streak itself. So again, left has the letter L in it, as does cold. So left of the jet streak is typically where you're going to find the colder air in the northern hemisphere. And if you're still facing east, if you look to the right, that's then you're going to be looking toward the south. But just the fact that you're looking to the right, that is in fact referred to as the right region of the jet streak. And if you're in the northern hemisphere, that's typically where you're going to have warmer air. And again, the word right has an R in it, and the word warm has an R in it. Just a way of remembering how this is set up when you're looking at a jet streak in the northern hemisphere. And a lot of times this region... Uh, these two uh, these two regions that we define, so left, right, and also exit, entrance, those two are often combined to illustrate specific points in the jet streak where we expect rising or sinking motion. So in this case, in this area of rising motion, that's typically referred to as the left exit region. And you'll whenever you've got a pronounced jet stream, you will see this terminology used a lot in some of the more technical forecast discussions by the SBC, the Weather Service, and the Weather Prediction Center, and some of the other related entity, entities. But this area of rising motion, we typically refer to as the left exit region. And this area of sinking motion, we refer to as the right exit region, just combining, just combining some terminology here. And in this region of rising motion, we typically refer to that as the right entrance region. And this area of sinking motion, we typically refer to as the left entrance region. So left exit region, right entrance region, that's where you're going to have rising motion present in the atmosphere, which means you might have an unsettled pattern at those two particular points in the jet streak. So just to summarize that point, left exit region, which is typically found over here in relation to the jet streak, just keep in mind how we define exit region and entrance region, and also keep in mind how we define left and right of the jet streak. So left exit region, rising motion, right entrance region, rising motion, right exit region, sinking motion, and left entrance region, sinking motion. So that's going to do it for this first look at jet streaks. You'll talk about these in much greater depth once you get into some of your later classes, in particular the Synoptic Laboratory. You're going to talk about jet streaks quite a bit. So you have that to look forward to. But for now, that's going to do it for this discussion on jet streaks. And uh, that's going to do it for this lecture on jets. So with that, I will see you all in the next lecture.